Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Christine Biglin. I am with St. Mary's County Library. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We have Barb Whipke, who is the owner and operator of Wild Birds Unlimited in Lexington Park and La Plata, uh, two stores that where you can find everything for our other friends in our backyard. Uh, tonight, uh, we are going to be talking about the top 20 backyard birds of Southern Maryland, uh, which ones they are, and how to attract them to your yard. So thank you for joining us, Barb. Take it away, please. Thank you. <laughs> So tonight we're going to do uh, share. I'm going to share my screen here because it's going to be a lot easier for me to show you what these birds look like, and so you'll be able to identify them when you do see them in the backyard. So, okay, so we're going to talk about these birds, who they are, what type of feeders that they prefer, and then what type of foods they eat. So before we get into it too much, we're going to talk about the basic type of feeders. Tray feeders, when we talk about tray feeders, we are talking about those flat feeders. They can be hanging feeders. They can be sitting on the ground. They can be setting on a table, a deck rail. But they're a basic flat feeder. Grab one here. It's going to be something like this. So when I mention a tray feeder, it's something flat that's going to hold the feed. Some birds aren't able to cling to a feeder on the side, or they're not able to eat very well from a little perch. So I'm going to mention some birds that would need a tray feeder. When you look at this feeder here, the bottom part of it we would consider a tray feeder. The top portion where you see the bluebird eating from, that's what we would call a hopper feeder. So a hopper feeders are those ones that resemble the little houses, the typical feeders that have been around forever. When you ask a child to draw a picture of a bird feeder, that's what they're usually going to draw. And that's a, what we call a hopper feeder. When we talk about a tube feeder, it's going to be something along these lines, just the straight up and down feeder. This particular one, we've added a tray to the bottom of it. So that turns this tube feeder now into a tray feeder. So when we talk about a tray feeder, this one would actually fit the bill for a tray feeder as well because we've added the tray to the bottom. A peanut feeder is going to be a feeder basically that holds peanuts. There's a lot of different styles of those, but basically it's a feeder that holds peanuts. A cylinder feeder is going to be one that holds, any of you who have shopped in our store yet, it's gonna hold cylinders like this. And I have some of those as examples as we go through the slideshow. So it's feeder, everybody's, Probably familiar if you've been feeding birds for a while, the little square blocks of suet like is on the side of this feeder. And then multi-purpose feeders, which is basically what this feeder is in front of you. Multi-purpose, it's a hopper, it's a tray, it's a suet feeder. So it serves multi-purposes. Up in the corner, that cylinder feeder I talked about, that's one of those right there. So before I go into this, where these birds came from to develop our top 20 birds, and actually I think I went to 24 because the bird that falls into the 24th category is one of those birds that everybody wants in the backyard or front yard for that matter. So I couldn't cut it off at 20. I had to cheat and go a little bit further. But the way I put this list together, there's something called Project Feeder Watch. It's done every year from November to April, where we just ask people to look out and count the feeders and record them, count the birds you see. And then from that, I've compiled a list of the most common birds seen. With that in mind, some of the birds you're gonna see on here tonight, you're not going to find in your yard right now because they're 
appear mostly in the winter months. Obviously cardinals are one of those that we have year round. So we're very fortunate that we get them all year round. Up in the left, that's our male cardinal. And then in the right is our female cardinal. The female's always going to be less vivid. I used to think, well, that's no fair. The male always gets to be the pretty one. But the female's doing most of the nest sitting. So we want them to be a little less inconspicuous when they're sitting on the nest. Right now, you're going to see some birds out there. You're like, well, that kind of looks like a cardinal, but it has a black bill on it. That's because those are juveniles. So start watching as you're looking out the next few days. Look for those birds that look for cardinal. If the bill is not orange, that's because you have juveniles going on out there. Cardinals are one of those birds that are not able to eat from a tube feeder. So you have these little perches here. They can land on there just fine. But if you notice, they don't have a whole lot of neck going on there. It's a very short, thick neck. So they can land there, but they're not able to then turn sideways to eat from that hole. So that's why most of the time you see cardinals eating on the ground. Adding that tray to that feeder I just had then would allow those cardinals to eat because they can now sit on that tray and eat forward facing from that bottom fork. So trays, I'm sorry, cardinals need to eat from those hopper feeders, the house looking feeders we had, a cylinder feeder like we have over there because they can perch and eat forward facing or he can stretch around and eat. He's got enough space there. They can use those tray feeders or they can pick up food from the ground but they need plenty of space. So if you notice that you're not getting a lot of cardinals at your feeders, it may be that the feeder you have doesn't have enough tray space for them. And then as far as food, they're not really picky eaters. They love sunflower seeds, chips. They also love safflower. So if any of you are using safflower right now to keep those blackbirds away from your feeders, your cardinals will be thrilled with that. The first year I added safflower to my feeders to shoo those annoying blackbirds away, I found that my cardinals loved it so much that I took one of my feeders, switched it over to safflower year round for my cardinals because they did love that a lot. And then if you tried our bark butter bits, they're also a huge fan of bark butter. Cardinals are a big fan of peanuts as well. The peanut chips, uh, peanuts already out of the shell. And then just a couple little tidbits. If you're not seeing cardinals at all, get up early in the morning, look out when the sun's barely up and that little dark shadow you see at your feeder, those are your cardinals. Or when the sun goes down and everybody's cleared the feeders, those last birds at your feeders, that's your cardinals. They don't like to be there when the feeders are really busy. So they tend to be the last one at the feeders at night and the first ones there in the morning. Both the male and females can sing. In a lot of birds, it's only the male who can sing. But female cardinals can sing and they do. Sadly, when they build their nest, they don't pick the best location. Um, they tend to build just a few feet off the ground, right next to a porch or a walkway. And then they sit there and sing and sing and sing and let all the predators know where they are. So unfortunately, they don't use that singing voice to, the, to an advantage for themselves. Number two, the dark-eyed junco. This is one of those I mentioned that you're not going to find right now. A lot of people know our juncos as snowbirds, little gray bird with a little white underbelly. Again, these are mostly, you'll notice there, not a whole lot of neck going on for them. So they tend to be a lot on the ground. 
But if you have tray feeders, you have those hopper feeders, good sources of flat feeders that they can eat from, they will come up to your feeders. Again, they like those black oil sunflowers, sunflower chips, and they also are big millet lovers as well. Number three is our morning doves. Again, morning doves tend to stay a lot on the ground. And again, because they have those big bodies. So if you're going to put a tray for them, you're going to need a big tray. Um, if you have a whole uh, hopper feeder, you're gonna need a larger hopper feeder. They will, again, the millet is a good one for them. Millet is a very light seed. Because it's so light, the wind tends to blow it out of your feeders a lot. And that's intentional. Most of our seed is designed to replicate something in nature. So millet is designed to replicate grass seed, which would be a natural part of their diet. So when you have millet in your feeders, the wind's gonna blow a lot of that out and that's intentional. So those ground feeders can grab that off of the ground and pick that up. So something with millet is a good one. Um, if you're having problems, if you've got bluebirds and you're having problems with house sparrows, then I'm going to tell you to stay away from millet. Don't feed anything with millet because millet is like candy to house sparrows. So you can reach out to us if house sparrows are an issue and we can talk through that problem with you. But in that case, we don't want to bring millet into your yard. It does eat a lot. Uh, about 20% of their body weight a day they will eat. They nest up to six times a season and lay two eggs in each nesting. The reason they nest a lot is because they do not pick the best locations. You may walk out and find an egg laying on your porch, laying on your deck rail, some random spot if you find a little tiny white egg laying somewhere there's a good chance that that's a dove. That little tiny head, there's not a whole lot going on in there. So they just kind of forget about the building a nest part and just drop those eggs wherever, and go on their merry way. Um, you may have a potted plant that's died sitting out there and they may decide that's a good spot for a nest and lay those eggs and start setting. But again, forget all about the nest building part. So. In order to keep their species going, they have to nest a lot because many of their nestings will end up in failures. And then the good old Carolina chickadees. So a lot of people think we have black capped chickadees. We do not. Our chickadees around here, at least in Southern Maryland, are Carolina chickadees. If I know a lot of you are watching from other areas, so I can't tell you for sure what you have, but if you are here in Southern Maryland, we have the Carolina chickadees here. There's a little bit of difference between the Carolina and the black capped chickadees. If we lived somewhere where we had both, I'm sure that we would learn the difference after a bit. But if you're here in Southern Maryland, just know you have Carolina chickadees. Um, they are a fun little bird. They will eat from any feeder you have tray feeder, hopper feeder, tube feeder, cylinder feeder, pretty much whatever you offer them they will eat. Um, peanuts, bark butter bits, mealworms, bark butter, whatever you give them. They're not picky little things. They make a call that sounds like they're saying their name, chickadee-dee-dee, chickadee-dee-dee. Cute little birds, but they are always on the move. They are known as a hoarder bird. A lot of our birds hoard food away in the fall for winter. Chickadees, as they hoard food away, they put it in a different location. So whatever their cache, it's called caching when they store that food away. So they're gonna cache this peanut here, this one here, this one here, and this one here. They've got a really good memory and they can remember where they put it, but only for 28 days. After 28 days, that memory is gone and they don't remember. So the way they overcome that is every 28 days, they move that food. They'll grab it out and move it somewhere else so that they can remember 
where it is. So if you ever watch chickadees, that's why they're always so busy is they're relocating that food to different locations so they'll remember where it is. So cool little birds to watch, but they just never stop. And then our tufted titmouse right up there with the chickadees. They're another fun one. If somebody walks in our store and they're like, I just want a birdhouse and they don't have a specific bird in mind, I'm always going to sell them a bluebird house. So reason being in our area, a bluebird house will house a chickadee, titmouse, bluebird obviously, or a Carolina bird, a Carolina wren. Four of the best little birds in this area. So with a bluebird house, you're gonna get the best bang for your buck here. So if you aren't specifically looking for any type of bird, you just want a nest box, I'm always going to point you toward a bluebird house because any of those four birds are awesome little birds to watch. So tufted titmouse is another fun one. Like the chickadees, they'll eat anything and eat from anything. The sunflower, the safflower, peanuts, they will also eat their peanuts in the shell. The chickadee is too small for that. But as you can see, this one, this is on my back deck on a little picnic table. I put a hand out there, full of them out there for the tough to tip mice and the blue jays. And he can pick them up even in that little, he, she um, can pick them up in that tiny little beak and carry them off. And he can get a full size one and carry them. Um, they're fun little birds. They do eat with their feet, so they'll hold them with their feet and then use their, their beak to crack them open. They're a lot of fun to watch. Their babies stay with them all winter long. So where most of the babies, you know, once they have them eating on their own and able to hunt, they send them off tough love. Tough to tip mice keep theirs with them all winter long. And sometimes some of them will even stay with them into the spring and help with raising the next young. So they definitely aren't pushing to become empty nesters. And then our downy woodpecker is our most common woodpecker in the area. So this one here is the male. And that's the, I know this because you can see that little bit of red on the back of the head. The female would not have the red on the back of her head. So this little guy is finishing up one of those cylinders there. That particular one has hot pepper in it so that the squirrels will leave it alone. They love su suets They're, or the type of feeder they'll eat from will be a suet feeder, peanut feeder, those hopper feeders or the cylinder feeders. Um, they really do love the, the cylinder feeders and the suet feeders especially. Um, this. This spring, I watched a daddy woodpecker, uh, Downey, bringing three little babies to the suet feeder. And he'd bring them and line them up in the tree where it was hanging nearby. And then he'd go to the suet and just take it and feed all the babies. And then pretty soon, the babies got till they were ready to eat. So you would have all four of them, the three babies and daddy, playing into the suet feeder eating. So that was really fun to watch them. So they love the suet. Um, any birds that are insect eaters? Can you hear that? Any birds that are insect eaters tend to like suet a lot. You'll also notice that the sharp pointed beak gives you a clue that that bird is an insect eater. So suet, bark butter, peanuts, any foods that have peanuts in them are a good food to offer to woodpeckers. So wood, Danny's do a cute little thing. If they get startled by something, if you look out at your feeders and you notice all the birds have cleared, but you've got a downy that is just frozen onto the side of the pole or the side of the feeder there. Something has startled all your other birds. Most of the birds tendency is to take flight. The downy woodpecker, or the hairy as well, will tend to just freeze and just be frozen there, not move. Or everybody else will fly away to safety. They will just freeze there. 
So that's always a sign that you've got a hawk or something out there that has startled them. And then Daddy Downey wins for Father of the Year. When Mom is nesting, the dad takes the night shift to set on the eggs or take care of the young. And then our house finches. So this one often confuses people. They will think they have purple finch. The only time we're going to get purple finch is in the winter and not even every winter. So if you think you have purple finch right now, I'm sorry, you don't, you have house finches. So we can clear that up for you, make that a little clearer. The one on the top center here, that's a female house finch. And the two lower ones with the red, that's your male house finch. And then we've got a little gold finch sneaking in down there on the bottom right. But the, the ones with the red, again, the males get to look pretty. And then the female's going to look more camouflaged so she can set on the nest. Those house finches are going to eat from either a tube feeder or a finch feeder. They'll also eat from a tray feeder as well. Tray feeders are awesome because truthfully, anybody can eat from a tray feeder. I know when I added my first tray feeder, my only regret was that I did not add it sooner because everybody can eat from a tray feeder. Finch love to eat Niger or finch blend. Um, if you don't have a finch feeder going, I recommend it. Anytime your feeders get full or when those annoying blackbirds move in and take over your feeders, if you have a finch feeder going, those blackbirds can't mess with that one. So that's a good way to feed your small finches and not have those blackbirds in there. House finches, I had mentioned turning that one feeder into a safflower feeder just for my cardinals. That is also a favorite of my house finches. They love, love safflower as well. Uh, house finches will never forget where a feeder is. Once they have found your feeder, they will never forget where your feeder is. So they will be back. Once they found it, they'll know where to come back and find it. If you stop in the store and you tell us, I have a bird nesting on a wreath on my door, we're going to tell you, you have a house fin. <laughs> That's about all the information we need to know to know that it's a house finch. We recommend in the spring, late February, if you don't want a bird, a house finch resting, nesting on your reef to take it down. Um, we have some nice flat decorative door hangers that you can put on your door that will still look pretty, but will not get you a nest in them. And then in the fall, once nesting season is over, you can put your wreath back up for the winter season. But otherwise, those house finch seem to love nesting on those wreaths. And then the blue jays. Blue jays get a rad, bad rap. Um, they're actually one of my favorite birds. They're a very intelligent bird. They are known as being a bully because they will eat baby birds. But so will your bluebirds and so will your cardinals. And nobody thinks a thing about them, but they will eat them just as often as a blue jay will. Blue jays are actually a good guardian to have around your yard. If you've got a snake trying to get into a nest, if you've got a hawk in your backyard, an owl in your backyard, they're going to let you know they are going to chase that hawk out of your yard. So they're actually a good bird to entice in to help watch over your yard. The best way to entice them in is right there with those peanuts. When we first moved in, uh, we moved here to St. Mary's in 2003 and we had no blue jays. Once we got a couple, every time I would hear them out there, I would go running out, JJ, JJ. Like a crazy woman, thank goodness we're back in the woods and nobody sees us, and a handful of peanuts, and I would lay them out on the rail. And pretty soon they started figuring out, oh, when the crazy lady yells, JJ, peanuts up here. And so they would come down pretty soon at 6.30 in the morning, 
they would start coming and yelling, crazy lady, crazy lady, bring me peanuts. And so we worked out a system here and <laughs> we have plenty of Blue Jays now. There's no shortage, um, but they do let us know. Uh, you know, we'll know if there's anything out in the backyard. And we know pretty quickly that there's a hawk or something out there. Um, we have an owl camera with nesting barred owls and they'll start carrying on and we'll flip the camera on and look and see that the owl's outside and pretty soon you see the owl flying quickly into the nest box to get away from the blue jays who have chased her in. So they, again, because of their body size, you're gonna need trays, hopper feeders, and they love peanut feeders, obviously. Uh, but again, if you've got a tray feeder, tray feeders, you can make a smorgasbord out of. As I'm filling my other feeders, I take a little bit of everything I'm putting in my other feeders and dump a little bit of that in my tray feeders. So they can find some of everything in the tray feeders. So their tray feeders are the best. And then any kind of nut blends, peanuts in or out of the shell, sunflowers for them. They will do this really cool thing where you'll see them pick up peanuts and drop it. And they'll do this a few times and then take off with the heaviest one. They are actually weighing them, looking for that peanut that is the heaviest. They can also hide their peanuts up to two miles away and remember where they found it. Unlike that squirrel who hides it, the minutes it's out of sight, the squirrel has no clue where he just put that peanut. One of our team members here at Lexington Park told a story one day where she watched this squirrel bury the, got all this work, bury the peanut. The blue jay sat there and watched. The squirrel left. The blue jay comes over and pops the peanut out of the ground and takes off with it. And that's your typical blue jay intelligent, extremely intelligent bird. And number nine, the cute little Carolina wren. That bird that wakes you up in the morning, that's that sweet, tiny little bird that's singing its heart out. They are a very loud little bird for that tiny little body. They like a hopper feeder, tray feeder, suet feeder. They're a big fan of suets. They'll eat suet, sunflower chips, peanut pieces, bark butter. They really love mealworms, um, live or dried. Either one are fine. The male can sing up to 40 different songs. So that's why you struggle to figure out who's singing in the morning because he does have a lot of different tunes. Carolina wrens, so most birds, we talk about a lot of birds that mate for life. When they mate for life, those birds typically, they mate for life, but they're only together during breeding season. Then they go off and do their own thing the rest of the year. Carolina wrens are the exception to that. They stay together all year long. Rather than just during nesting season, they stay together. Can you grab me one of those little pockets? So these silly little nesting pockets, hanging these on your porch is a great way to bring these little guys in. They love to roost somewhere near you. Quite often we'll get pictures of, there's something sleeping on the porch rail up in the rafters, and all we can see is a little tiny brown blob, and we know right away it's a Carolina wren. But if you hang these up on your porch or somewhere near your house, two of them will sleep in these. And because I mentioned how they bond for, or they bond year round, our pair sleeps in this every night. We'll watch them go to bed and we'll say, oh, they're going to bed for the night. During nesting season, when she's nesting, she'll nest in a pot right next to this. And our intention was just to have this up for winter originally. And then we realized when she was nesting, he was still sleeping in it while she was nesting. And so he would come over to the flower pot like he was saying goodnight to her. And then he would go into bed. And it was the cutest thing. So we leave the roosting pocket up year round. So, but this is not for them to nest in. It's actually just for them to sleep in. 
So all year long, they're sleeping in this one. So those are fun to bring in those Carolina rounds. Okay. And number 10 is the white nested, white breasted nuthatch. So this is what we think of as our upside down bird. So when you're looking out there at the tree and you're seeing something walking upside down the tree, that is your white breasted nuthatch. These birds, will come to the hopper feeders, that cylinder feeder, peanut feeders, or the tube feeder. So they're another one that's not real particular. They do love the peanut feeders, any kind of seed with the nut blends in them, sunflower, or they're another one that likes the mealworms or bark butter. If you haven't tried bark butter, it is, it kind of looks like peanut butter but you can use a fork and just spread it right onto a tree. So that's a really cool way to bring birds in that might not come to a bird feeder, but you can bring them into your yard and get a chance to see them. And black and white warblers, just a lot of birds that wouldn't typically be feeder birds, but you can bring them in closer. So that's our upside down birds. They will actually hatch their own seed. They'll get it in the tree bark and use it there to crack it open by using the crevices of the tree to break it open. So another smart little bird. And then our American goldfinch. Just like we talked about with the house finches, again, that's another good one to have a finch feeder for because then when those blackbirds move in, you still have a feeder that they can eat from. Unlike the house finch that likes safflower, goldfinches are not able to eat safflower. So if you switch to a lot of safflower to keep those blackbirds out, you don't have something there to feed those, feed, those birds. Um, two feeders they can eat from. So Niger, finch blend, sunflower chips they love and black oil. They are a vegetarian bird, strictly vegetarian. So a lot of birds will feed insects to their young. Goldfinch will not. They are strictly vegetarian. With that in mind, they are going to wait until late fall to nest. They are our last nesters of the season. So we're not going to see them nesting until August and September. They wanna make sure that Food is plentiful and they're waiting for everything to go to seed. So right now we tend to think, oh, there's plenty of things out there in nature for the birds. We're seeing things blooming, things growing. There must be plenty for them to eat. But things really don't become plentiful for the birds until they go to seed. So that's why our goldfinch are waiting and hanging out. They're not ready to nest yet. So about the time you start seeing the milkweed and the cattail start to feather out that, and things go to seed, that's when they're going to nest. They're going to use that fluff to make their nest. And then they're going to use the seed to, uh, the seed, not the insects, uh, but the seed to feed the young because they want to make sure that seed is plentiful so that they have plenty of non-insects to feed their young. And then number 12, so this is our second top woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker. So this one people often get confused by and think it's the red-headed woodpecker. So if you see that woodpecker there in the bottom, he's got the red on the belly. You don't often get a look at that red belly. What you notice is the red on the head, but there is actually red on the belly of that woodpecker, which makes him the red-bellied woodpecker. The red-headed woodpecker is actually going to be solid red, solid black, and solid white, where this guy has a checkerboard pattern here on his back. So if you see checkerboard, that one is the red-headed woodpecker. It's rare here in Southern Maryland that you're going to see the red-headed woodpecker at our feeders. A few people have, but not 
it's not common here in Southern Maryland to see them at our feeders. Um, to get a good look at them, uh, point lookout, I've seen them down there and I've also seen them on bays, but I don't, we don't see them much at feeders. Um, they have appeared, but not commonly. So red belly is our common one at feeders though. So look for that black and white checkerboard and then the red on the head. The female is going to have red that goes all, I'm sorry, the male is gonna have red that goes all the way from the beak, all the way to the back. The female is gonna have a break on her cap. So her red won't be solid all the way back. And the red belly is gonna eat just like the downy from suet feeders, peanut feeders, hopper feeders, and the cylinder feeders. We have found that the woodpeckers really love those cylinder feeders because the cylinders, that solid log, it, they can cling to that kind of like they would a tree bark. So it's a very natural feeling to them. So they seem to really like those. Um, and then the foods, the suet, the bark butter, the peanuts, any of the seed blends that have peanuts in them. And then just a little tip, the tongue is three times the length of that bill. So any of you that have your food in cages right now, again, because of those blackbirds, I know I keep hitting on those darn blackbirds, I know. But those red-bellied woodpeckers can still get their head in and then they have that long tongue that they use like a tool and they can still reach in those cages and get them some food. And number 13, the white-throated sparrow. Again, we're gonna zoom past this one pretty quickly. This is another one of those winter birds we're only gonna see in the winter. They tend to show up about the same time as the dark-eyed juncos. They're gonna come down from Canada, spend their winters here with us where it's a little warmer. They're gonna spend a lot of time on the ground. But if you have a tray feeder and a hopper feeder, they will absolutely come up to your feeders. They love those no mess blends, those bark butter bits, and they will also eat that millet. And then the house sparrows. This is what I refer to as parking lot birds. Um, if you come into our store, we have a lot of these at our feeders here. Um, in 1851, a hundred of these birds were released in Brooklyn because somebody thought this was a great idea. Um, like often happens when humans decide to release some kind of wild animals that aren't native to America, we end up with problems. And that's what we've ended up with with these guys. These ones are a huge problem for bluebirds. They will kill bluebirds. We just had a customer in the store today who is having a huge battle with bluebirds or sparrows trying to kill her bluebirds right now. And so if you have nesting bluebirds and you're struggling with that, um, definitely reach out to me. You can just email the store and I can try to help you work with that. I'm also the St. Mary's County Coordinator for the Maryland Bluebird Society. And so I can try to help you work through those issues as well. But if you do have house sparrows, um, I recommend you not feed millet. Um, if you are trying to have bluebirds at your house um, because millet is like a candy to these birds. Um, if you ever visit our La Plata store, you're gonna notice that we have a bluebird house set up outside. And because we have a bluebird house upside, outside, and obviously it's a parking lot with a lot of these birds, we have a ring on it. So it reduces the entrance hole so that sparrows and bluebirds cannot nest in that. So only Carolina wrens and chickadees could ever nest in that house because it would end up a disaster for bluebirds if they tried to nest in there. And we don't want to increase the population of these birds. It, they're a big enough problem as it is. So if anybody's struggling with these and needs some advice, definitely reach out and I'll help you with that. And the good old American robin. Um, it's actually funny because we don't, often see these at feeders. So when we do see them quite often, people will say, send us a picture and say, what is this bird? And then they feel so silly when they realize it's just a good old American robin. 
but it is so unusual to see them at feeders. However, we have a new food that is bringing them to feeders. So it's a bluebird bugberry blend, and I have to read that or I cannot say that because it's a tongue twister. This food is actually bringing the, blue, the robins into feeders. So that's been, it was actually designed for the bluebirds, but we're finding that the robins really appreciate that food a lot. Um, they will come to trays and hoppers. Obviously, they're just not real familiar with tube feeders and that. So, but a tray and a hopper with the right foods, which is mealworms, bark butter, insects, berries, the kind of stuff that's in this food, they will come to feeders. Robins are here year round. This is another one that throws people off. There, we'll hear this like, oh my gosh, it's only January and the robins are back already. Nope, the robins have been here all winter long. When it's cold and snowy, they tend to move back into the woods where there's ground cover and they can dig into the mulch to find the worms and things. But then when we have those little warm days and it's not frozen, They'll come out into your yards because it's easier to find the worms. Nothing's frozen. It's been raining. And then when it gets cold enough, they'll move back into the woods again. But it always messes with people's mind because our parents taught us that the robins show up when it's spring. But they're here year round. And a single robin can eat 14 feet of earthworms in a single day. And then number 16, another one of those little human interference thing. Uh, they're very intelligent birds. They'll eat from a tray or a hopper feeder. They love peanuts, millet, bark butter, and suet. Very, very, very smart birds. Um, they are not a protected species. So if you found a starling and wanted to have it as a pet, you absolutely could have it as a pet. Um, in 1890, a guy decided that we should have every bird in America that was in Shakespeare. So he only brought in just a few dozen. And this is where we are today. So I'm sure most all of you have had issues with starlings from those few dozen that were brought in. So again, if you're having problems with starlings, um, we have cages. Safflower is a good food to use with all blackbirds. Um, they're not able to crack that seed. And again, the cages. So definitely if you're having blackbird problems, just stop and see us. The easiest way to do it is take a picture of your feeders, bring your feeders with you if you want. Just take pictures and bring them on your phone and we can look at it and try to help you work through those problems to solve it. You should be starting to see your blackbird problems become less, um, unless it's starlings. Um, if it's red-winged blackbirds or brackles, once they start working the fields, which, you know, they're starting to do, cut the grains and that, now the grackles tend to move out to the fields, so they become less of a problem. Starlings, unfortunately, they are very intelligent, like I mentioned, and they like a free meal year round. So if they know you feed year round, uh, why, why move around and expend all that energy going to the fields and coming back? So they do tend to stay around where there's field feeders year round. Um, if there's a neighborhood, that's even better because there's like all these different free restaurants to go to. So again, we can help you though. Stop in and see us. Spot song sparrow is another fun little one. They are often found on the ground. You usually hear them first because they're down there just jumping and digging in the mulch and that, looking for grubs and things. But they will come up to a feeder if you've got a tray or a hopper style feeder. Remember the hopper was the one that looks like the house. They love the no mess blends. That's the when I say no mess, that's the seed that's already been shelled. Bark butter bits, and again, the millet. Any of the sparrows are big fans of millet, but again, you have to weigh that out because if house sparrows are an issue, you don't want to bring in the millet.
much. So we point you toward other things. Uh, the female house song sparrow chooses her mate based on his singing skills. And then the common grackle. So this is on the right is the adult grackle. And then that's the baby over there on the left begging to be fed. Grackles are hilarious little babies. They will beg anybody and anything to feed them. If you've been in our store, you've watched where we have the feeder cams going from Cornell Lab up in New York. And we always just laugh at those grackles because anybody that lands on the feeder, doesn't matter what the species is, they'll just go from bird to bird begging to be fed. Everybody that lands is a potential candidate to feed them. So they are pretty funny to watch. Again, trays and hopper feeders. If you're trying to get rid of them, cages and safflowers are your friend to keep them out. They do love sunflower. They love peanuts. They love millet. They love it all. They are a copycat. They're really good at imitating other birds' calls. And they are definitely voted the most unliked bird, especially this year. This has been a really tough year for grackles. Um, typically in my yard, we're out in the woods and we typically get a nesting pair every year. And so we get to enjoy them because it's just one pair a year. That has not been the case this year. So I know if I'm having a lot of problems with grackles, I know you all that always have problems with grackles are really struggling this year. And then the red-winged blackbird. So believe it or not, on the right is the male and on the left is the female. Nobody ever believes this when they bring us a picture of this one on the left and we tell them that yes, that is a female red-winged blackbird. And you're gonna notice that striping through it and then kind of the orange under the chin will help you to identify that female. They do have a pretty song, so it is nice to hear them, but it gets old really fast when they bring the whole clan to visit. And again, trays, hopper feeders, but if you're trying to keep them away, safflower in cages. Um, they like the black oil sunflower, sunflower chips, and millet. That male there on the left, um, he really likes to get around. Typically, he's going to have five to six females in a season, up to 15 in a single season. And then nine, uh, number 20 is our brown-headed cowbirds. So they are what we call a brood parasite. So that's the male. The female is just a plain Jane. She's going to have that same kind of beak, but she is a lighter brown. Um, I should have included a picture in her. When you have that bird that you just cannot even think of any way to describe her, that's probably going to be a cowbird. Typically, they're going to be on the ground. And she is as plain as it comes. Um, she's going to be smaller than the, the male, about the size of a bluebird, small enough that she can get into a bluebird house. She does not build her own nest. She goes and drops an egg in other people's nest or other birds' nests and lets them raise them for her. Um, it is a native species, so it is illegal to disturb that egg. You have to just leave it there, whether it's a Carolina wren, a chickadee tip mice bluebird, whoever's nest she dropped it in, you have to just leave it there and let it go. Let nature take its course. Typically, in a single season, that female cowbird is going to drop off about 30 to 40 eggs for other birds to raise. Uh, it's because she used to uh, travel with the bison herds and she knew she wouldn't have time before the herds would move on to sit and incubate her eggs. A bird's main goal is to keep their species alive. So in order to do that, she had to find a workaround. Her workaround was to let other birds do the job. So that's 
the way they get around it is drop it and let the other birth. So you're going to see things out there if you, especially if you get on Facebook and uh, some of the forums and that people are going to tell you, shake it, throw them away, do other things. Do not do that. They have been known to come back and check to make sure their egg is okay. And if their egg is not, they have been known to destroy the rest of the eggs in the nest. And like I said, they are a native species. It's nature. It's what nature does. It's been doing it for years. You've got to just let it happen. So I know it can be frustrating. The, the, pro, the biggest problem that people tend to have with it is they're usually dropping it in a species that's smaller than them. So that egg is going to hatch sooner. So that one's going to hatch, say, three days before, you know, the little Carolina or Ren or whoever. So when mom comes back with food, guess who's constantly getting the food? With that said, I have seen it play out a few times in the Carolina Ren where that cowbird fledged early, was out of the nest, and was kind of left on its own while mom and dad continued caring for the nest. So I would say that sometimes it kind of equals itself out, but whatever, you've got to just let it happen. And then I mentioned that we went a little bit over 20 because we got to get to the magic 24. Harry woodpecker. We do have quite a few of these around here. They're going to look a lot like your downy woodpeckers. Don't assume what you're seeing is a hairy woodpecker, or I'm sorry, is a downy woodpecker. Hairies are going to be a couple inches bigger than your downy, but they're going to look a lot like your downy woodpecker. A couple inches bigger, and that beak is a lot longer on this one. So on the hairy, if you get a side profile, you're going to find the beak is as long as the side profile of the head. So start paying closer attention when you look out there and you see what you think is a downy. Pay attention if it's not, maybe just a little bit bigger than your typical downy. Same thing, the red on the head is gonna tell you it's a female, I'm sorry, it's a male. No red, it's a female. Um, food is the same, the suet, the bark butter, peanuts, peanut blends. 22, the northern mockingbirds. They love suet, tray feeders, mealworms, raisins. They're a copycat bird. They can copy your microwave, your car alarm, your car horn, any sounds. The key is they copy it in threes. So if you're hearing a bird out there, pay attention to whether it's in threes every time. If that sound is always happening in three, there's a good chance that's a mockingbird tricking you into thinking it's something else, but they're always gonna make that in phrase. They have over 200 different songs that they can sing and they are extremely protective of their nests. Um, sometimes they can become a problem with hoarding their, hoarding your feeders from all of your other birds. Again, if that happens, come and see us and we can help you with that too. 23, northern flicker, not commonly a feeder bird. However, this year there has been a shortage of natural food sources. So we have been seeing them a lot coming to our seed cylinder and our suet cylinder feeders. Normally this woodpecker feeds on the ground, um, a seed eater and they love insects, so um, particularly ants. So if you catch them around the base of a tree, you may find that there, you've got an ant pile around there or just ant piles on the ground. And then the 24 we were pushing to get to is the Eastern Bluebird because everybody wants the Bluebird. So trays, hopper feeders, um, we've got a blend. If you've used our bark butter bits, check out our buggin bits, which is the bark butter bits mixed with mealworms. I already mentioned that new food that has proven to be a big hit with the bluebirds, the bugberry, bluebird bugberry blend. They are a cavity nester, so we need to put bluebird boxes up for them. We have been able to bring the population back by people putting up bluebird boxes for them. 
They're a water loving bird. If you have always wanted to have bluebirds in your yard, the key is food, shelter, water. One of the best times to bring them in, if you've never had them in your yard, is in the winter time by offering a heated bird bath. When you've got water in the winter and none of your neighbors do, guess whose yard they're going to pick? So then if you have water in the winter, you've got a shelter for them, you fed them all winter, come springtime, there's no reason for them to leave. So that's a great way to get them in. And then questions. Oh, you, you did it, Barb. I was a little skeptical. <laughs> you, you, fed, <laughs> you fit them all in the hour, I know. <laughs> Um, and especially with the 24, I didn't know if you could do it, but that was great. Um, so uh, one person did ask uh, early on uh, if there was an app that you recommend for identifying birds or bird calls. Yeah, so there is a Merlin app that is great for identifying calls, but I just caution everybody not to rely on it. So the other day, um, just to prove my point with it, I was down at Abel Four, and I was using it and I'm sitting there and I'm watching this mockingbird making all these calls. And I'm literally, my eyes on him as he's making them. And gosh, I can't even remember what all he was pretending to be, but it was like everything from a grosbeak to an Eastern meadow lark. And it was just, and I'm literally watching him and watching the app as he's making all of these calls. And so it is great but it's not 100% foolproof, especially when you're dealing with a mockingbird. But it's great to take out there, when you hear a call, you know, listen for this call and then find the bird and get your eyes on the bird and see, you know, okay, it's making it now. Okay, yeah, I see it. And, you know, match the bird to the call at the same time. But just because, it says, oh, look, there's a pink flamingo in my yard. Oh my gosh, I've got a pink <laughs> flamingo. Um, don't trust it. <laughs> so it's like quite often people are like, oh, I guess I have this. No, you don't. They're a Western only bird. So it's, but it's, yeah, the Merlin app is a great one for that. And it will show you a picture of the bird. It will pop up as it's IDing it, but just, and make sure you load the packet just for the area where you are. So, you know, if you're traveling or wherever, it, you'll tell it where you are and you can download the packet for that area. So it's a great tool, but it's not foolproof. Right. Um, and it is nice because for a visual ID, you can put right. in, it's about this size, you know, like sparrow size or robin size and what colors are on it. And it gives you a short list of things that, might, right. that it might be. So. Yeah, it is, it is a nice app. Yeah, and if you can get a picture of the bird, you can identify by picture too. It'll let you download a picture and you can identify by photo. And it, it is pretty accurate there too. Oh, that's cool. Um, oh, somebody said oh, that they uh, used to live in Centerville, Virginia, and they had a mockingbird that attacked them every morning. They varied <laughs> the times they left the house, but it would still swoop down and scare me. I never messed with the nest and there were not any feeders around. Yes, and that's it. With a mockingbird, you don't have to mess with the nest. You just have to come near the nest. Um, it, it's just making sure that, yeah. So in cases like that, we have told people, you know, go out with an umbrella if you need to, walk to your car with an umbrella. But yeah, they are very protective of their nests and you don't even have to go anywhere near the nest. Yeah, and they go after the crows. Like I see them harassing. They do, the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, David said he once saw a bird grab a bat in flight at dusk. It was a oh, normal wow. size, like not very big. So he didn't think it was an eagle or an owl. Uh huh. But that's, that's really something. Yeah. Hard to know. Um, Oh, something that I remembered when you were talking about the the juveniles, uh, like you brought it up with the cardinals because you said like their uh, their beaks were a little different color. Um, 
And something you said once that I didn't really realize is that the juveniles are adult size. Like yeah, there's no so, little size of the, the bird you're looking for. Exactly, yeah. When a baby bird leaves its nest, a juvenile leaves its nest, it's actually adult size. So the difference in what you're seeing is that it's not fully feathered. Typically it's the tail feathers that aren't fully grown in. So if you're looking at a bird and you're thinking, I'm thinking that's smaller, pay attention. Usually you're gonna notice that what's really missing is the tail feathers. The hummingbirds are a great one. Um, when you're, you know, we'll hear people like, oh, I just saw a small hummingbird. Take a second look at it and you're probably gonna notice that it's actually the tail feathers are shorter. And so you've got a juvenile and while I'm thinking about it right now, if you would, if you, as you're seeing those juveniles, if you would go to eBird.com and set yourself an account up and enter what you're seeing, especially when you're seeing any juveniles of anything right now, because we're still in the middle of the bird breeding atlas where they're taking count of all of the, the breeding birds. So, and I know um, at least here in St. Mary's and Charles, there's still a big hole for hummingbirds that they're trying to fill. And I'm sure a lot of other birds too. But, you know, if you can help fill in some of those holes, that would be a huge help. Um, oh, you know, you didn't actually mention hummingbirds on your list. Yeah, nope. They're actually, believe it or not, because we only do. It's chosen from Project Feeder Watch, and that is done from November to March. So oh. they're not here when it's when the count is done. Oh, that's why. Okay, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and that's something to watch for. Um, project Feeder Watch is actually a good citizen science project to get involved with. Um, it was actually. Um, We've, I think we've got some of the literature here in the store, but you can just Google Project Feeder One. And it's basically, you just watch your feeder for 15 minutes or so and record what you see. And it just, you know, that's things like, well, the bluebirds, you know, we were, numbers were really going down until, you know, we got involved and started putting up nesting boxes and help bring the numbers back up. So, it just helps us to keep an eye on those things ahead of time before it becomes a problem. Well, that's great. 